Hi, welcome to yet another edition of Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies project and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. So yes, that's right. It's the three of us uh, back uh, together again. We've done, I don't know how many episodes we've done together. We definitely did one sort of state of blockchain, which I think might have been at the end of last year. I think so, so, yeah. I think it was right before... Yeah, it was right before New Year's, I think. Yeah, yeah. So we're doing that again. We wanted to do a quarterly, a little bit less now. Now, this is going to be uh, somewhat different than last time in that we'll talk uh, also about our expectations about the future, some ideas about where this is all leading that go beyond just looking the next six months, but thinking uh, a few years ahead. And then what I'm also really looking forward to is that Maher, who's who's the man on top of everything going on, especially all the crowd sales and stuff. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna speak a bit about Slocket, so we're gonna discuss that and and their crowd sale or or or, or not their crowd sale. Um, <laughs> so yeah, but I'm sure many people are curious about that, and and I I look forward to that as well. So with that out of the way, I wanted to kind of introduce the, the first topic we have here, which is an idea that has been on my mind for a while. Because it's easy when you, you sort of work on, on in this industry and, you know, work on blockchains and stuff, you know, you tend to think what's possible in six months, what's possible in a year. But if you think a bit further out, right, if you think of what's, what's, what are the effects going to be in 10 years? Um, it's quite interesting. And, and one of the ways that, uh, one of the things that I think will happen, and, and one of the ways that I've been phrasing it is that this concept of open source business. So and let, let me explain that. Of course, we all are familiar with open source software, right? So for example, open source, um, you know, web development platforms. So it used to be very expensive to start a website. It used to be expensive to start um, online shop. And today that's very cheap. You can sort of get it out of a box, set it up and go. So some, some, starting some businesses has become super cheap, uh, where in the past, you know, you had to buy servers and, and custom software and database, et cetera, et cetera, which could have cost millions of dollars just to start up. Um, but if you look at organizations today, the sort of technology components, be it databases or um, websites and stuff like that is just one small part of their costs. A lot of it are as other things such as HR processes, compliance, accounting, auditing, and all the kind of internal logic processes that run an organization. And those haven't really been affected in the same way by something like open source. But if now what's going to happen that is that we will implement some of these processes using smart contracts so that really the core processes, decision processes and, and logic of an organization could be done using smart contracts. And then let's say that gets open sourced. So an example could be an insurance company. So you have the, all the core logic of an insurance company, how are claims managed, what happens when this happens, and if these conditions, like you implement all of that using smart contracts, you open source that. And all of a sudden, the cost of creating, for example, a new insurance company has shrunk maybe by 95%, right? So maybe in the past, it would cost you, let's say, $100 million and it take five years to create a, a new, you know, sort of regular full-scale insurance company. And maybe then you have all that logic. I mean, you still need to do some things, right? You need to hire a lawyer, incorporate uh, maybe deploy this, do some marketing and stuff. But maybe instead of taking five years, it's going to take you five months. And maybe instead of $100 million, it will cost you $1 million. And maybe for other types of businesses, you could have similar kind of cost savings. So I think that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, and I think even even for some of the costs like uh, you know hiring a lawyer, I, I think similarly, a lot of that is going to, is going to shrink in cost as well. And, and, and so what are some of the, the effects of that? Um, so, you know, for example, you can think of that there's going to be a massive increase in competition. Uh, you can also, another way to think about it is in terms of the pace of innovation. Because let's say now I, the insurance company I run, 
I didn't design it myself, right? Uh, the, all the core logic processes, basically it's an open source project that I, I just pulled and implemented. And now if people contribute to the open source process, new innovations, new ways of working, I can implement those uh, in my own company at an extremely rapid pace, right? It could essentially be sort of, you know, pull the changes and implement them, which of course would, could mean that you have maybe a hundred different companies that it, use the same code and that, imp that innovate at an extremely rapid pace all over the world. Whereas you will have those companies built the old way, they wouldn't be able to do that at all. They would have to sort of finance all their innovations internally as opposed to kind of benefiting from the innovation that's happening with the public, uh, the public open source code. And I think these are, these are interesting ideas and I think they really, could mean some extremely radical change. Uh, yeah, so so this is this is one of the things. But I'm curious, what are you, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, uh, we can go ahead and uh, look at the insurance exam insurance uh, idea you mentioned with an example. Like let's let's say let's say one let's take one of the simplest examples of insurances, which is like insurance against delays in flights. So. We want to, let's say the three of us, we want to start a company that insures people against delays in flights. If their flight gets delayed by more than four hours for whatever reason, they get a certain amount of money else for each flight they they want to buy insurance for, they, they pay us a premium. So walk us through, Brian, of about how we would manage all our business processes using blockchain, like how, how we would do you know how how we would sell our insurance how we would do claims management like when people want, are claiming us to pay something how we would do that and then tell us how we would do marketing so we have a good vision of uh, the way you see these companies being formed i kind of think of it like this right so so now if you talk about something like claims management if an insurance company is created today, right, they'll have to think about what does claims management look like, right? So they'll, they'll maybe hire some old insurance executive people who know that and they'll have to set up this process. And it's essentially, you know, some inputs, something happens and then there's some output, right? So inputs could be data such as uh, flight data or customer data uh, and then some process happens that determines, you know, for example, is there a claim to be paid out or not? Uh, and then, uh, you know, the output could be a payment made. So you would have to, we would have to think through now, how does that work, right? We would have to set, design those things from scratch. And then I think if you, if you had a sort of smart contract based insurance company, and, and I think the important thing here is not even that the whole thing lives on a blockchain. It could live on a block. I mean, but the whole thing is that the core processes are implemented using a blockchain, using smart contracts. You know, you can essentially pull that, and then of course you can have automated data fees such as flight uh, things and stuff. And and some some of the stuff would be the same as the same uh, same as a day, for example, marketing. Right, wouldn't really change. Um, so, I guess my point, in a way. Blockchain is not even the most important part here. I think the most important part here is the ability to express uh, a huge range of a company's processes in code. Um, so you could potentially have a similar thing without blockchains and smart contracts, right? You could have somebody creating some software that runs, let's say, a flight insurance company, and it's open source that and then you know maybe you could go and you could do this in another country in another continent and you could have similar provide uh, benefit from similar um advantages and cost savings but i think what's different and what's particular about smart contracts uh, is that people are actually trying to do this now right people are actually trying to take core business processes and implement them in block in code which is something I think they didn't try to do before. So I think to some extent, it's also this kind of mindset shift that's at the core here. So what you're saying is that the, the, the advent of blockchain technology, I mean, people could have done this before. People could have written 
the code to run an insurance company or the code to run a bank or any type of business and have that business logic open source and be sort of uh, public and 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 and, uh, and a public good in, in a sense, which is what open source technology is in a sense. Uh, but but now since we have smart contracts, it's shifted the mindset and. Uh, people are now looking at how they can automate a lot of these things using blockchains. Yeah, exactly. And 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 there is there is uh, a reason why this is happening now. And it's that before people probably would have been very hesitant to say, okay, let's take the core processes and implement them via code because there was a well, what if there's something wrong? What if uh, you know there's an error? And then this is not just something that doesn't work on a website, but you know, core functions could go wrong. And uh, of course, with blockchains, if you can run this in a shared way, well, maybe you can pull in the auditing company so that they run a node and they see and they can certify that and it can be shared across stakeholders and all. So you can have that assurance so that you can say, okay, I we're comfortable now taking these core processes and, and actually automating them, running them by a code. Uh, and of course, the other thing is also if, if, corp, if some of these processes involve various stakeholders, again, in the past, it might have been difficult to convince people then to automate them because uh, they'll be like, well, who runs it now if there's different parties involved? And with smart contracts, you can kind of do that. Yeah, I think that adds to the, so there's an incentive now because uh, there's an incentive because you can you can run this code in a decentralized way where everybody is uh, is 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 coming to consensus on the code that's being written so that we eliminate any type of errors or mistakes that that may happen um, and and I think there's also just the incentive that you know your your, your competitors are doing it and your your uh, <laughs> your boss is telling you to look into it so there's that incentive as well. So like stating that a bit differently. Um... Today, when you have an organization that might be, say, an insurance company uh, making insurance on flight flight delays, um, there are there are business processes, meaning there are a certain set of steps that the business takes to to evaluate any particular claim, and uh, these processes might be happening in, let's say, for lack of a better word, in an analog way, which means. The claim comes in into their say SAP system somewhere, and then uh, uh, there are a set of people who review it, who then send emails to other people to review it, and then in on an email on an email thread, like when a certain amount of people review it, then it gets sent to the accounting department. The accounting department then disburses the money, something like that, right? So there's a a, a set of uh, process that you go through, and then followed by a conclusion. Now, what you could do in a smart contract is uh, is basically say that uh, the claim comes in, maybe maybe on IPFS as a transparent document, and then all of these people who are supposed to evaluate that claim need to approve and sign it with their digital signature, send it to the smart contract, and once a certain number of signatures are accumulated, the smart contract automatically disburses it, disburses the money to the person who was making that claim. So you made this whole chain of processes that today might run in a in a thread of emails, run rather on a blockchain, and anyone can follow this this these these uh, these let's say internal threads as to what really happened and why a particular claim was accepted or rejected. Right now, uh, now I I think like for me for me the the questions are are mostly twofold. It's one question is. Do companies really want that level of transparency? Um, right, like, uh, is is there is there going to be some sort of loss of competitive advantage because uh, because of of this transparency? Second thing is one of the advantages of building a company or or a, or an insurance business transparently on the blockchain is that other people can come in to your company and contribute something and be paid for it. So it's more inclusive in a way. To people who might be in different jurisdictions and who might want to extend your business in, say, a different country. So, um, I think like that's the advantage of openness, and the disadvantage is um, that everything is so transparent, so competitive advantage is lost. So, do you think, Brian, that uh, there are going to be particular businesses that 
that flourish in this model and some others that don't. But you don't necessarily have to make it all public, right? So there could be a blockchain that's just run internally in the company and maybe, let's say, there's some auditing companies that also participate in running that. So in this example, right, you probably wouldn't want to have that on a public blockchain because let's say now claims are being processed. I can see whose signature is processing my claim. You know, maybe there's all kinds of, I could contact it, find, figure out their identity, maybe, you know, there, there's a lot of issues with that. So I don't think this kind of thing will generally be run on a regular blockchain. It might for some instances, right? So you, I think you will have kind of insurance type things on, on Ethereum and, and blockchains like that. But uh, what I mean more is that, and I think this is, remains to be seen whether that's actually going to happen, but you could imagine that the insurance company is going to be, as before, essentially um, doing this in a, in a way that's not transparent, not visible, but it's still being done using smart contracts. Uh, and it's, I think it's a very open question whether this actually makes sense or not, um, whether the benefits there outweigh the, you know, all the cost of implementing that and, and operating that. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe, right? And if it did, then I think that could change a lot of things. Uh, also, because it, it gives sort of, like a general framework of handling these processes. Like what you've described was, is a good example, right? So you have that claim, which is some sort of like object on a blockchain. And then there's sort of its state, which is like, where is it in that process of claims management, right? Like, and you're right. And some people would look at it, maybe certify something, sign it with the digital signature. It's like sort of a state change on, on that blockchain, right? So it's, it's like a general paradigm of how this is done. And having even that kind of standardization of processes might be very interesting because then uh, it could become much easier to say, okay, there is a way this is done generally. Uh, so I can just take that instead of building it from scratch. Yeah, I mean, much like in web technologies, you have standardization of practices and processes and the way you transact data, you could potentially have the same type of standardization than, say, the insurance market. Like, I think that's a really good observation. Well, what do you guys think about how the, all this, all these things we've been talking about since a while ago might have an impact on, you know, on consumer experience? So all, everything that we're describing so far is it's mainly, you know, back-end infrastructure implementing an insurance company as a as a smart contract or as an open source sort of package that you just install and run and um how, how do you think this might influence the way that us consumers uh subscribe to our insurance like staying in the insurance example of course uh, subscribe uh, pay for it get insurance benefits paid back I mean, I, I guess in the end, right, for, for a lot of this stuff to really go to its logical conclusion, you kind of require that people have private keys that they sign things with. Maybe you don't absolutely need it, right? You could still have a web interface where people, like, enter their stuff and, and like, maybe there's, uh, maybe the smart contracts are just used sort of beyond that, but... You know, to really get the, the full benefits, um, you would require people to have private keys, right? So Another thing that I think you, you need for a lot of these things is you need people using some sort of a cryptocurrency. Yeah, you're right, yeah. I mean, again, I think it's like you can do it without and you may be able to get a significant number of the benefits, but to get the sort of full automation, then yeah, uh, having cryptocurrency, yeah, I agree, right? So those things would be... Uh, and I presume that will also mean people having hardware devices, right? Because so maybe that's going to become a ubiquitous thing, right? Everybody having their little wallets that they manage a lot of their um, applications with. So in, in, in the case of insurance, uh, where if you had some sort of a, a, an insurance company built from scratch using... Um, no, sorry, not built from scratch, but built using an open source uh, software package. Um, you could do that for really cheap, as you mentioned. 
and even potentially you could have a whole lot of automation in there where if you have a, an oracle or several oracles and maybe prediction markets feeding in your um, you know the the data that the inf that the insurance company makes its decisions on um, that could potentially change the way that you know claims are managed I think you know think about for example um, you're a victim of a burglary well you file a claim with the police and if the police reports are served as some sort of an oracle to the insurance company it's no longer the um, the person who has been subject to burglary that makes the claim the insurance company knows about it before you even have time to make a claim right so the uh, you, you make your police report and it's sort of a push process from the police report straight to the insurance company and the insurance company will pay you your you know reimburse you for whatever uh, you've been stolen, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you have a lot of automation, of course, for all kinds of data feeds, and uh, I think that would be very interesting uh, as well. And then uh, I think flight insurance is a, is a good example, right? If I think that data is mostly uh, publicly available. So yeah, that, that could be automated there. I might want to present a different way of, uh, of stating the same thing. So what we are saying is like this technology, it a, it it makes uh, it enables like business processes to be run on say open blockchains or open source software uh, in a cryptographic fashion and it allows many different organizations to coordinate to uh, get to a particular result right now um, now we can actually I think I think there's a different way to state uh, state the case as well so so let's 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 take an example. So one of the one of the most interesting examples, which I think many people are familiar with, is the is the mortgage market, and specifically these uh, financial instruments called CDOs that were implicated in the two thousand eight crisis. So what happens in the financial market, for example, is let's say I want to go and uh, buy buy a house, and I want I want money to buy that house. So I get I go to a mortgage mortgage company. I uh, I get some money from the mortgage company as a loan. I go and buy the house, and then I give uh, I give some claim to the mortgage company in in case I default. So let's say I I got a million dollars, and uh, I got it on the condition that I'll be shipping them fifty thousand dollars for the next forty years. Fifty thousand dollars each. So if for monthly, I might be shipping them. I don't know three thousand dollars. So. I go to the mortgage company and make an arrangement like, okay, I get a million and every month I'm going to sh ship you like $3,000 in the future. And in case I stop shipping you these $3,000, then you can basically claim my house and it becomes your house and then you can sell it and retrieve uh, the initial money you, you, you sent to me. So basically my, my house itself is guarantee against me not sending this money. Now... You could imagine, for instance, uh, that this interaction could be replaced by the combination of a smart contract and a legal contract. So, uh, so what the smart contract does is it gives the it gives me as the user an interface way to send these three thousand dollars every month. So let's say there's like a contract, contract A, where I'm supposed to send like three thousand dollars every month. And then there's uh, in this particular smart contract, it ref refers to a normal English language contract. And in that English language contract, um, we have conditions for what happens if I fail to send these $3,000 over. So they might be able to foreclose on my home, sell it off, recover their money, etc. Now, the interesting part starts to happen where I, when there are like thousands of these uh, like mortgage smart contracts on the same blockchain. So today the way the way this, this system works is uh, some big investment bank like uh, Goldman Sachs might uh, might go to these a lot of different mortgage companies and end up buying their positions. So, so the mortgage company has a claim on receiving these thousand dollars, three thousand dollars from me every month. So Goldman Sachs comes to them and says, "Okay, sell this claim, sell sell this flow of cash to me so that I receive it in the future instead of you, and take." say let's let's say take this 1.2 million dollars in exchange for it so the mortgage company gets 1.2 million from the investment bank 
and then and then my money the three thousand dollars a month goes to the investment bank in the future now then what the investment bank will do is it'll say okay this is going to collect like a thousand of these different ones similar ones and then it's going to create a new security for it so it's going to create let's say like uh, what this is technically called a cdo and then this cdo basically has money coming in from different mortgages made in the real estate market so maybe let's say a thousand of them and then it's going to sell shares inside this uh, cdo to a lot of different investors all over the world so maybe some somebody in norway ends up owning one of these shares so one of these cdo shares what they entitled the person to get is a claim over cash flows occurring in different mortgages across different parts of the united states at a particular time so it's like a fractional claim across a lot of different mortgages and that is what makes them safe right because they're like a thousand different homeowners who need to pay and if some of them end up paying you are fine you you get your money back as an investor now as, as a, in a smart contract system what could happen is like you could automate the whole thing where um your mortgage with your mortgage company is represented as a smart contract which has let's say its own token right and then these tokens can be bought by other companies and then your uh, your mortgage can be repackaged as cdos or these other higher level instruments and then sold to other people across the economy and all of this buying and selling of these mortgages is happening through you know decentralized exchanges or other smart contracts that are running on ethereum so this whole market starting from all the people who are borrowing money to all of the people who are ultimately lending lending money basically gets connected through a big giant system of smart contracts and a lot of different organizations are participating to make this system run so the the boundary between organization kind of blurs a bit but the whole system works uh in the aggregate right so the way the way the way the, the analogy i i take for explaining this this kind of uh, process automation is uh, the analog the analogy of the pump plumbing system if you imagine the plumbing system uh what does what does the plumbing system of a city do essentially um what it does is a, any city has like a set of different water sources so in in the city of basel where i live it might be the rhine there might be some wells around here somewhere far there might be a lake there's a, a lot of different water sources those are the points those are sources and then there are points of drainage which means like i am a consumer so so some of the water must come to me so i am uh, uh, and there are like say millions of these what does the plumbing system do the plumbing system is an infrastructure that gives a way for this water to flow physically from the point of source to the point of drain now if you look at the mortgage market what's happening is uh, there are points of sources which are people paying their monthly uh monthly monthly dues like me paying 1000 3000 so that's like i'm a source in this system and who's the drain the drain is some investor who basically gave the principal and ultimately wants a fractional claim over my reserves So just as you have the plumbing system for a big city you can build the real estate plumbing system on a on a blockchain with a set of like thousands of different smart contracts working together with each other and the kind of market keeps adapting and uh, and the plumbing system also keeps keeps changing right would so would do you agree with this kind of vision that um is just any system where you have money flowing in from a, a a big set of people going towards another big set of people and the linkage between these two the ways by which money m- must flow from one to another is very complex you can auto build that whole system using using smart contracts exactly right and i i think there's some other interesting things that you can sort of um take from there so one coming back to the the mortgage example right so w- one of the things was that when all these mortgages started going sour right there was a sort of a disconnect between the securities that package all these mortgages and the mortgages themselves right so i might buy this mortgage backed security 
and I wouldn't know exactly, first of all, which actual mortgages are in there and what is their current state? You know, are they being paid or are they uh, in delay? Um, and of course, if you had those mortgages being managed on a blockchain and that sort of triggers all up to the security, you could have in real time uh, see the state of that mortgage. And I think that same sort of analogy works for lots of things, right? It also works for supply chains and having transparency about where your products came from. Or another example is this, this idea of liquid democracy. Maybe I'm misrepresenting it a little bit, but the sort of idea would be that I, uh, I, I can delegate maybe my voting rights to somebody else who then votes, right? So you could also imagine something like that, that uh, democratic rights, right? Currently in a representative democracy, you sort of give it to somebody and they just vote for you. Um, but if I could like delegate it according to some rules I set up and maybe maybe the person I delegate to delegates it further on specific issues because they're not the best expert there, you could have that same kind of transparency there, for example. Um, and I, th I think that same thing holds in, in so many use cases. So yeah, I, th I, and I think uh, the example you made is, is great and plumbing is sort of a nice, a nice way to think about it. Yeah, and much like, uh, so actually you wrote this in some of the notes here, Brian, that lines between your organizations might blur. And I think much like the plumbing system, you know, the plumbing system interconnects uh, from sources and then comes through, for example, um, you know, uh, pipes belonging to the city, and then may flow into pipes belonging to um, some some uh, like in a house or a business, and then back into the city pipes. Um, but the the contents of those pipes um, knows you know no owner, right? Uh, it's it's uh, it's so you know, th those lines may become blurred, and we may it may be difficult to know when information is flowing. Or when value is being transferred, exactly where it is in the system and who it belongs to. Today's magic word is plumbing. P L U M B I N G. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. If you look at something like chemical engineering, right? Like, um which is uh, which is basically the science of making fluids flow and uh, and like flow on 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 a, on, a, on a certain set of conditions across point a to point b right chemical engineering is essentially that the plumbing system is exactly that and uh, so in chemical engineering you have like fluids that are flowing and in this case what we are doing is like instead of fluids it's it's money that's flowing and we just have built uh, sort of the, with the blockchain and smart contracts, we have a new kind of infrastructure by which we can build the, the pumps, the walls, and all of this that are needed to make financial money flow from people to people. And uh, not only that, we have a way by which we can make this infrastructure, as you correctly say, uh, publicly owned, like not owned by a, by a single company or maybe owned by lots of different organizations at the same time. And uh, it just it just flows from the points where it's needed to to the points where people are supplying it. Yeah, so let's take, maybe take this opportunity to talk about the, the infrastructure and, and what the infrastructure might look like. And, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about recently. And, and um, so, you know, we... We talk about public blockchains and, and on one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum, we talk about private or permission blockchain, although sometimes those two terms get uh, interch or interchanged, not necessarily. So what, what I'm getting to is that all, all, of, all of these blockchains that we expect that will happen to, in the, that will come to exist in the future will be on this spectrum at some point. So you'll have fully public blockchains and fully private blockchains. And somewhere in the middle, you may have a blockchain that is owned by a federation of companies. Uh, you may have blockchains that are owned by states. You may have blockchains that are owned by you know, continents. You may have uh, like a, a, a European-wide blockchain that handles uh, transfer of funds between different countries or that handles transfer of information about citizens, that sort of thing. 
And interoperability, I think, for this sort of world to come to fruition is essential. So you need to be able to have ways through which this information can information and value can transact from one type of system to another. Otherwise, you still you you we just end up with the same type of system we have now, where everything exists in silos. Uh, what are your thoughts on how interoperability can occur in uh, in a future where we have thousands, perhaps millions, of different blockchains, not all operating on the same protocols? You know, um, different blockchain protocols are be, be, are coming to uh, to to to. To the ecosystem, you know things like Tendermint, things like Open Chain, Multi Chain, Big Chain DB, etc. Uh, we need to have a sort of r some rails on which we can exchange value at the top. Like for example, Bitcoin. You know, we all uh, agree today that Bitcoin is sort of one blockchain on which we all agree that has value, and that's why Bitcoin has has remained the biggest blockchain, and that's why Bitcoin is the point of entry for buying any other type of cryptocurrency. How do you see interoperability op operating in the future, given that sense? So I think, I personally think like uh, there are many companies that are already solving these uh, companies and projects that are already solving this interoperability problem. And uh, and, and, and it's a big problem, right? Like the, 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 the way to see it is um, you essentially want financial plumbing, but like parts of this system might uh, exist on different blockchains and they might you might need for value to flow between these blockchains seamlessly right so how how would, would, would we do that in the future now there are already like two interesting projects in in this direction so one is btc relay what does btc relay do uh, btc relay is uh, a smart contract a set of smart contracts on ethereum which have the ability to verify bitcoin transactions so the kind of thing that is possible is um, with BDC relay, you can build uh, some logic like when Sebastian transfers to Brian on the Bitcoin blockchain, 10 BTC, then a particular smart contract will transfer Sebastian, uh, I don't know, 100 ether automatically. So when Sebastian transfers 10 Bitcoin to Brian, uh, he can publish this proof on the Ethereum blockchain, BTC Relay will verify this proof. And if correct, they automatically trigger this smart contract to transfer, let's say 100 Ether to Sebastian. So there's already, already a step on the interoperability between blockchains. The other, the other big project on the interoperability space is Interledger, which, uh, which uh, we have an episode coming up with the Interledger folks. But in a sense, it is a way by which uh, value can flow between chains like sebastian is on the uh, bitcoin blockchain and brian is on 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 the ether blockchain and sebastian wants to pay brian and they are on different blockchains but uh interledger makes a series of uh infrastructural hops by which this value can flow from bitcoin to ether seamlessly then you have some centralized versions so these are all like decentralized versions both of both interledger and uh and BDC relay, then you have centralized interoperability like Shapeshift. But I, I have the uh, centralized inter interoperability meaning like if you want to do the same thing instead of Interledger, you can do it with Shapeshift. But then uh, I, I, I personally suspect that there are going to be more complicated forms of interaction where there are smart contracts on one chain interacting with contracts on another chain. And these are going to be kind of hard in the beginning. Uh, Vitalik himself has a lot of uh, a, a big paper on making this kind of interoperability work, and and somehow I feel uh, like zero knowledge proofs have a role to play here in the future. So once you have good systems for zero knowledge proofs, interoperability between chains is going to become really easy because there might be a particular computation on one chain with a zero knowledge proof you can prove to another chain that that computation was done correctly and then the other chain can just trust this proof and do something else in return so that kind of systems are also coming so yeah i do believe the future is like a thousands thousands of chains but the interoperability problem is only solved for a certain limited set of interactions today yeah Meher, absolutely i think you have you have put it so so beautifully and elegantly and 
And, and I, actually, I would love to read that paper from Vitalik. Perhaps we can also link to it in the show notes. So I, I, I don't have much to add here. But let's talk a little bit about Slocket because they've been, if you think ahead of, you know, where is the space going? What is the Ethereum ecosystem going to look like? What are all these applications going to look like on there? I mean, we haven't actually seen very much so far, right? It's still mostly experiments, planning, or people developing some code that nobody uses. But now with uh, Slocket, they're, you know, getting serious. So it's... Can you give us a little bit of background, what's been going on there and, and what, what that will mean for the future um, of Ethereum and of dApps? Yeah, so in the big picture, like when Vitaly came out with his white paper, uh, he, he, he essentially popularized again the idea of the decentralized autonomous organization. This idea kind of was floating around in the cyber cyberspace for quite a while, even before Ethereum came in. But Vitalik basically pitched Ethereum as kind of the substrate on which you could build organizations like that. And now that Ethereum is kind of operating, uh, what we are, what we seem to be heading into is, uh, is a phase where there are different models of how DAOs sh should build and what they should do. So Slockit is one of the first projects to come out come with come up with a like serious vision of what a d uh, how a dao should be built how how should it operate itself what should it do and what kinds of returns should it produce for the for the people that are invested in the dao now i must say that there are a couple of different visions that are that are that are coming together and slocket is not the only one but since it's the it's the most further along let's just describe what what the vision really is so what the the way the way Slocket is approaching the building of a DAO, is it is it says that DAOs are best thought of of a set of people who come together and build like a decentralized capital allocation firm or a decentralized VC if you want to go colloquial. So they have they essentially say that. Uh, the DAO ecosystem will consist of many different players. So the first player is the DAO itself, which is essentially a set of people who invested some Ether and got a token in return. So let's say I might invest 100 Ether and I got a 10,000 Slocket tokens, right, in the, in the current crowd sale. So there are many people around the world who, who do this. And let's say there are like 100 billion shares owned by 10,000 different people. So they constitute the DAO. And while creating this DAO, uh, all of the ether they invested becomes kind of the capital of the DAO. So uh, the DAO might have, say, $30 million of capital. Now, that's the first player. That's player one, the DAO. Then there's another player, which is the, um, the service provider or contractor. They keep changing between these names. So the contractor is, let's say, a company that, that, has, that is an INC, a GmbH, or an AGE. And uh, what the contractor does is it, it comes to the DAO and it says, I want to build a particular product and I need say $5 million for developing this product. So here's my proposal for building this product and what I'll do with it, give me $5 million worth of ether. So in this case, what uh, Slocket itself is doing is, is it's saying that it's going to build the, what is what it calls the Ethereum computer which is essentially a system which merges IoT and the blockchain, is going to go to the DAO and say, okay, give me these many million dollars worth of Ether and I will take this money and I will build this particular computer. Now, now the DAO members, the DAO shareholders, essentially need to decide whether they want to invest $5 million of that DAO to the contractor, which is Slocket game behind this case. So they have to make this capital allocation decision. This is like a VC-like decision, right? Like whether they want to fund this uh, speculative project or not. And the idea is once, if they, if they agree to fund this speculative project, then uh, the contractor goes and, and builds uh, the product. It ships the product. And whenever this product is installed somewhere in the real world, this product makes some kind of revenue for the DAO. So... Slocket's main thesis, now what, what is Slocket's main thesis? Its thesis is that a set of people who are collectively unknown to each other and who came together 
during a moment of uh, cre of creation of a DAO will be collectively great at making these capital allocation decisions. And they just might be better than conventional VC firms or angel firms. So that seems to be the hypothesis that they are testing. So that's one of the models. Okay, interesting. But how, it, I have, uh, being a little bit skeptical here, do you really think that is their motivation? Because if you think of it as a VC, right? So now they've raised, which is crazy actually, they've raised $9 million as we record this. When we went through the show notes before, like an hour ago, they had raised $2 million, they raised $2 million just in this time. So if you think of it as a VC, right? So VC is going to invest in all kinds of things. Also, VCs tend to be fairly diversified, right? They so certainly wouldn't put in like, you know, 60% of the portfolio or whatever into Slocket. So it doesn't seem to make any sense for them to say, okay, we're going to try to raise crowdfunding by trying to create this VC-like structure and then hoping they invest money here. And probably this our thing is not going to have that kind of independence, right? Probably it's just going to give the money to Slocket. Isn't that right? If you look at the code itself, and I have I've actually studied the whole Slocket Slocket code, and there's a paper from for interested people, there's a paper from uh, Christoph Jensch describing the whole code, and and it's actually a pretty simple uh, set of smart contracts that do this. Uh, if you look at the code itself, um, the the future shareholders of this DAO, which they call the DAO, uh, can actually reject Slocket's proposal, and um, uh, and not decide to give money to, for the development of the Ethereum computer. It is it is certainly possible if you just look at the code itself. Now, in reality, I do think that they will end up giving the money to Slocket Game simply simply for the reason that it's such an early model that they won't have too many competitive proposals. I guess like I mean, like startup guys around the world are not thinking that they are going to make a product and pitch it to this DAO instead of a normal VC today. So there's not much, I don't think there'll be a lot of proposals that come to them, at least when the system begins. And Slocket Game Beha's Ethereum computer might be one of the first ones to come. So they'll end up approving it. But in theory, they could, they could reject it because the DAO is supposed to be a separate entity from Slocket Game Beha itself. And even in the token sale, um, None of the founders of Slocket Gmbh get any stake in the DAO itself. So that that at least seems to seems to be the plan. Now, my my the fundamental question I think about is, is this statement that a big chunk of people collectively unknown to each other can make great capital allocation allocation decisions, is this really true? I mean, if you if if I look at the great capital allocators of the world, you know, I always imagine a person like right? you see Warren Buffett. That's a great capital allocator. He knows where to invest and where not. Or somebody like George Soros. That's that's a great guy. That you know, you might think like Andy Groves, Intel CEO. That's a great capital allocator. Now, what they're saying is the wisdom of the crowd can be better than the than a single person capital allocator, quote unquote. And if, if this hypothesis is true, then it's a big conclusion. I just wonder if it's true or not. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, if you say wisdom of the crowds, right? So it's still going to be a very, very fairly small set of people who will participate in this. And you have to imagine that many of them, even if you think about it rationally, let's say now I'm going to put in $200 worth of money in this DAO thing or even a thousand it's not going to be worth my time to like look at all these proposals and like contribute to it so it's only going to be make sense for a small portion and I think one of the problems here is even if we accept that you know somehow aggregating intelligence can lead to superior outcomes is that there's sort of a lack of responsibility here right you can always say okay somebody else is doing it and in the end, that might just mean that everybody's going to kind of go with the default choice, whatever that is. Well, let me put it like this. I think there's kind of two different questions. One is in the abstract, uh, are crowds good at making certain predictions? And I think in some cases, they certainly are. And the other is, does that 
help with something like making investments decisions for a VC like vehicle, especially at this context as well, right? Because a big part is also software. Like how easy is it for me to evaluate these proposals, cast my vote? There's no real software for this, which is going to make it uh, for a terrible user experience. I, I would I would agree on on kind of at least the second count. I would definitely agree on that. If I look at like governance softwares today, uh, they are very badly adapted to a problem like this. So you, in a sense, have say ten thousand people that need to agree on what should be the name of the DAO for one. And then they must agree on whether they want to ship $5 million to slock it game or not. And I, and I suspect Slack is the, the most common tool we use today for, for this kind of uh, inter interdao collaboration is Slack. And I suppose Slack is completely inadequate for something like this because you need kind of voting systems. You start to need prediction markets. You need like ways to analyze these investment opportunities. And I just think the governance tools are not there. So currently, what I've kind of observed from this ecosystem is there's this company which is called Dowlink, which has kind of taken upon itself to build some of these governance tools. And they are going to themselves try to become some con a contractor or service provider to the DAO in addition to Slocket GmbH. So they are going to come up with their own proposal in the future. But... It's a very interesting experiment that that's like, look, Bitcoin has, has trouble just coming like Bitcoin, which is like, you know, these, I don't know, a hundred different people, a hundred different important stakeholders distributed across the world. Uh, Bitcoin has trouble coming to consensus on, on something as simple as a block size. Now, this is a DAO which might have like, a, like more than thousand, a thousand people or maybe 10,000 people and they have to come on consensus on like decisions on how they're going to spend all of this money. So it's going to be like a great experiment in, in governance mechanisms, like decentralized governance mechanisms. And I, and that's what makes this investment really risky, like not knowing how these things will be done and knowing that there are no tools for it makes it like a real pioneer experiment. So that's that's like, but 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 you know, like Slocket is just like one vision of what the DAO should do. Um, Slocket's vision is simple: the DAO should be like this set of people who make investment decisions. That's it. That's that's what the DAO should do. But then there are other kinds of visions coming along as well for how how should you sh one should build the DAO economy, and maybe in, like interested uh, listeners should uh, follow Mache Olpinski's blog. And we we'll link that blog in the show, and he comes up with a vision of how DAO should be. So, in in Mache's case, what he says is that investment decisions should be made by the market, not through governance mechanisms. So, Slocket says it should be government governance mechanisms to make investment decisions. What Mache says is uh, investment decisions are kind of the prerogative of the free market, not uh, free market as a whole, rather than a governance mechanism of one kind. So check out kind of his view, which is um, the, the, that the economy we will end up building with these uh, organizations is um, there will be like thousands of DAOs and they will be all linked to each other through, uh, through financial, financial means. So there might be, let's say, a, let's say a parent DAO that pulls some money to do some particular thing. And then some other person... Uh, 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 some other person in a different part of the world might think, okay, they, he wants to iterate on, on the product of this parent DAO. So he cre ends up creating a new DAO and decides to give some of the shares in his new DAO to shareholders of the old DAO or some of the profits in his new DAO to the profits of the old DAO, get some support from the old DAO members and build this product and commercialize it. And then some other guy basically forks this, this new uh, DAO's uh, product and so you end up with this system of DAOs where there are like thousands and they have relationships between each other. The market decides the value of the token of each DAO. And in combination, you get like a super organism made up of like thousands of different DAOs doing, solving thousands of small problems together. 
so that's like another vision that's coming and we don't know what we are walking into here so these are all experiments Thanks so much for your insights there. And, and I, I personally look really forward to our Slocket episode, which should be coming up soon as well. And I'm, I'm sure that's going to be very interesting to dive a bit deeper in there. And, and, and this is exciting also from the perspective, this is probably going to be the biggest crowd sale uh, since Ethereum in this ecosystem, maybe even bigger than Ethereum. And that's that's pretty crazy if one thinks of the kind of speculative nature of this project. I guess Ethereum was a bit like that too, in being extremely speculative and, and kind of out there. So uh, it seems people have not lost their risk aversion when it comes to things like that. And of course, with the Ethereum success it has been, that's that's quite understandable. So thanks so much for, for the discussion. Hopefully we'll, we'll do something like that soon again. And um, thanks so much for our listeners uh, for listening. So we, we put out new episodes every Monday. You can subscribe to it uh, using your favorite podcast application or watch the videos on youtube.com. That's youtube.com slash absent Bitcoin. And uh, if you would like to, you can also leave us a review and then we will send you a t-shirt. So you just got to send us an email at show at absent Bitcoin.com. Tell us about it. Uh, let us know about your uh, size, address, etc. And, and we'll get that to you along with some uh, big new stickers that are about to be finished. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week. Bye.